All right. Well, good morning, Lake Point Church. How are we doing? Everybody had a good week? Awesome. Good deal. Hey, if you're able, if you would, please stand. Um, we're going to open our hearts this morning by reading God's Word together. So if you could, uh, you can stand with me. Um, you don't have to turn to this, but you can just listen along or you can turn, if you please, uh, to Matthew. We're going to be in chapter 4, and we're going to read... Uh, just to get our hearts uh, warmed up, we're going to read about how Jesus is our ultimate example in the face of temptation. So Matthew chapter 4, four starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written... Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put your Lord God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms in the world and their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. But Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels came and they attended him. Heavenly Father, we just come before you with an open heart, Lord. We come before you just so thankful. So, so thankful that you've given us a perfect example in Jesus to follow. And we thank you for sending him to pay the debt that man could not pay and to bring us together with you. Lord, we just want to open up the scriptures this morning, grow closer to you, and we just thank you. So we just pray that the scriptures speak to us, and it's your word alone that moves us. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. All right, well, like I said, good morning. I'm so happy to uh, be up here in front of you. Uh, my name is Joe Salvatore. Um, I'm actually the student minister uh, here at Lake Point Church, and, uh, you know, I get to every now and then, uh, I'm lucky enough to get up here and, and read God's Word with you guys together, and it, it's just so awesome uh, uh, to be here with you, and uh, for all the, all the new folks here, welcome. We're so happy. We love connecting with new people here at Lake Point. Uh, it's just something we really thrive on. Uh, so welcome if you're new, if you're listening online, hey, God bless you for taking the time to do that. Um, thank you so much. So let me explain what you just saw. Now, you know I'm up here if it's a sports analogy to lead things off. It's just, it's just my thing. That's what I do, okay? So what you saw here was a college wrestling match, okay? And for some of you in here know there were no tables, there were no ladder, ladders, no chairs, no WWF belts on the line. It was collegiate style wrestling, okay, what they do in the Olympics, all right, and it was a match between Penn State and Ohio State. These are two wrestling powerhouses, okay, these are two of the top teams. So that was a heavyweight match. The weight class is 285 pounds, okay, so you had one wrestler named Seth Nevels, very good wrestler from Penn State, and then you have Gary Traub from Ohio State. Now, Gary weighs about 236 pounds, so you can imagine kind of the, um, the disadvantage he's at. And Gary's a good wrestler, but he certainly doesn't stack up skill-wise with the, with the best in the country. I mean, you know, you could consider him a good, average, middle-of-the-pack wrestler. But look, let me tell you what Gary does. What Gary does is he somehow wins these matches against people. If you look at it on paper, you think, no, Gary won't win that match. But he somehow does it. And you know how he does it? It's in the third period, in the last few minutes of the match, Gary just comes back out of nowhere, and it's because he has more endurance than the rest of the guys he wrestles. Gary somehow finds a way to come back because of his endurance. Now, you'll see in these matches, if you ever take time to watch one, the other guy comes back to the circle, kind of tired, he's got his hand on his hip, but Gary runs back and he's right there waiting on him. So Gary, and it's almost laughable because you just know it's coming. You know it's coming by the end of the match. Gary's just going to come with this storm of points, and he does almost every single time, and so he got the nickname Gas Tank Gary. They call him Gas Tank Gary because his gas tank never ends. He just goes and goes and goes, and he wins all of these matches 
just on endurance alone. I mean, it, like I said, it's almost laughable because you could see it coming, and he's beating guys that he probably shouldn't. So it, it's just really cool to see. I think Gary has some good qualities that we all can take, right? Perseverance and endurance. We get endurance from a good work ethic. We get endurance from diligence. Um, but I think those are good qualities to have in our life regardless, regardless what it is we're doing. Because mar- uh, life is a nonstop marathon. I think we could agree with that, right? It is a nonstop marathon to the finish line, and we have twists, we have turns, things don't go our way, sometimes things are going great, but it is a nonstop run to the finish line. And quite honestly, to survive it and run it well, we need a little endurance, right? We need a little something to kind of keep us going. And um, although we have great lives, and we can take joy in the world, and God's given us so much to enjoy in this world, um, there's all kinds of things that can kind of slow our run down. I think we'd all agree with that, right? Stress, that's a good one. Stress, um, all the deadlines we have to meet, all the, all the uh, obligations we have, that can slow us down. Family, right? We love our families, but hey, love gets a little messy sometimes. Pastor Frank kind of talked about that a couple weeks ago. Sometimes our families, sometimes we have disagreements within the family that kind of slow us down. Sin, sin's also a big one. Sometimes when sin controls us, it slows down our run, and it causes us to stumble. And you know what? It's not always the bad things that can exhaust us, right? Sometimes there's a lot of good things that can exhaust us, right? If you got a new addition to the family coming, having a a baby boy or baby girl, there's a lot that goes into that. While it is a blessing from God, and while it's an amazing thing, there's a lot that goes into it. Got to get the nursery ready. Got to make sure you have everything. And then there's the whole getting to the hospital, it's kind of a stressful time. Although it's a blessing, it's something that can exhaust you a little bit. You get in that new job promotion. Maybe you've been searching for this job, you've been waiting on this opportunity, and boom, it comes. And now you got to start something new. Now you got to break your routine. Now you've got to get into a new comfort zone. It can be a little stressful. It can be a little exhausting. So just to kind of characterize everything I just said. Let me ask you guys a question. You can answer it honestly to yourselves. And I'm, I can, I can answer, ask you this question because believe me, I've, I've got an answer for it. Think about when things are going bad. When you're struggling, maybe the budget's tight. Maybe there's an illness in the family. What are we doing? Boy, we're right here in worship. Hands are up, singing our hearts out, praying in our small groups, tithing, doing all the things we need to do because we desperately need God. And that's great. That's what we should do. But think about when things are going really good. Think about that for just a minute. And ask yourself, are you bringing that same kind of consistent worship? Because I got the answer for you. There's many times I've caught myself not doing that. You see, a good friend of mine, good mentor of mine, told me that we as Christians have to continuously build fences with our worship, with our faithfulness to God. We have to continuously build up the fences that protect us from the world, from the sin that this world has, because if we don't do that, if we don't have fences of faith putting up through worship, through constant uh, relationship with God, these things can beat on us and beat on us and beat on us and wear us out. And sometimes we just become spiritually flat. Have you ever felt And it's okay to admit it. Have you ever felt that you've just become spiritually flat? Stress. Just kind of mentioned that one, right? Everything we've got to meet in this world, we put so much weight on things that we have to meet sometimes and finances and all these things, and it just wears us out. Students, peer pressure. That's a big one for you guys, right? I think sometimes, and I was here, believe me, I was a kid. I was a kid once. I know the drill. You feel like you have to live up to what everybody else is around you doing because they're doing it, because they're seen as cool. You have to do that. And let me tell you something. It leads you down a path that's away from God's will, that's away from what he has for you, and it gets exhausting trying to come back. I think sometimes in life, we completely exhaust ourselves because we become people pleasers, or we become world pleasers instead of God pleasers. And what I mean by that is, just like the student example, 
I don't want to face this rejection, so let me just partake in this. Or we feel like we need to be rich. We feel like we need to have all the money in the world, not, to, not for financial security and not to give, but to meet the standard that the world sets for us. I think sometimes we become world pleasers. And all these things are unavoidable. All these things are just a part of life, just like when you run on the trail, just like when you are, are on your marathon run, you're going to fall, you're going to stumble. There's things you just can't get around. But the fact is, I think sometimes, speaking from experience, we try to carry those things on our own. We try to muscle through it on our own. And what happens is when we do that, we sometimes cope with things negatively. So we turn to sinful things. And we turn to things that aren't what God says to give us instant satisfaction. And what those things do is they give us instant satisfaction. But in the long run, they don't fuel us. Listen, I've never known someone to binge drink or whatever and then wake up the next morning and feel like I really solved a lot of problems. If you do, let me know, because I don't. I've never known someone that's had an affair or had a marriage fail because of immoral reasons, because of, of, of a sinful thing or, or something like that. I've never heard of somebody doing that and saying, we solved a lot of problems with that. I don't have to carry weight anymore. I remember there was a time in my life where I just became spiritually flat. And ironically enough, it was right after I came to Christ. So I came to Christ um, in uh, 2010 at Georgia Southern University. I think if you guys were here last time, you heard my testimony so I came to Christ, got involved with the campus ministry, loved it, got involved with the leadership, was uh, leading small groups, and things were going great. My senior year, I had an opportunity to coach uh, the Georgia Southern wrestling team. That was something I coveted. I coveted coaching for a really long time. I loved the sport of wrestling, but I put coaching way up on this pedestal. I want to be a great coach. I want to lead kids to championships and uh, uh, win team championships and be the greatest coach ever. That was, that was what my heart, that's where my heart was. So I had two options. Take this coaching gig while I'm still in college. It's not the smartest idea. Take this coaching gig, exhaust all my time and all my resources into it, or continue this path of getting in small groups with Campus Crusade. Well, which by the way, any college kids in here, Campus Crusade, you need to look into it. It's an awesome ministry. Well, guess the road I took? <laughs> I took the coaching. And let me tell you something. That was a miserable semester. I had zero free time. Ask my wife. I have zero free time. I was constantly just engulfed in this team and trying to manage it. And I completely put the ministry that I was building and that relationship with God that I was building and that foundation that I was building, I completely threw it away. When you take steps back like that, and I'm speaking from experience, when you separate yourself sometimes, it makes you spiritually flat. And then what that did to me is, when I graduated, my wife and I got married, um, and to be quite honest with you, because I'd gotten out of my faith, because I'd gotten out of the practice of worshiping God, I was a lousy spiritual leader in our house for a good two years. We didn't pray together. We didn't do those things together. And it was, I truly believe it was because of my just being spiritually flat. The thing is, guys, we can get spiritually exhausted from the world. We need fuel. You can't run a marathon without fuel. Today, we are going to examine what God's word says about this because God gave us fuel, and that's through Jesus. Jesus is everlasting fuel that will never run dry, that will always be there for you, and that will always, always carry you through your run, but we don't always remember that. We really lose sight of that sometimes. So we're going to examine what God's Word says about that and how we can stay spiritually fueled. Heavenly Father, we come before you one more time. We ask that the Scriptures just jump off the page to us. They come in our hearts and Lord, we just pray that your word moves us this morning and that we can leave here closer to you than we came in. Amen. 
So the bulk of where we're going to be this morning, and we're going to bounce around a little bit, um, but the bulk of where we're going to be is in the book of Hebrews. We're going to be in chapter 12. And as you, uh, as you turn there, let me just give you a little context so you know kind of what was going on in this book. So this book was written to newly converted Jewish people who, who newly converted to Christianity. They just had accepted Christ as their Savior. Now, the thing about this is, at the, under this time, they were under severe persecution by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, of course, who, who uh, persecuted Jesus and who put Jesus on the cross. Now, they were under extreme persecution to fall away from Jesus, to not serve Christ, because here's the thing. The Romans knew that if this, thing, if this Christianity thing explodes, we're in trouble, because they saw how powerful Christ was, and they knew that it was spreading. Jesus gave the Great Commission, send the gospel to all the nations. They knew that there was something special coming. So they did everything they could to persecute these newly converted Jews to getting away from Christianity. And in most cases, it was working. There were, there were people facing death. There were people facing prison. And a lot of these newly converted Jews were converting back to Judaism, which was an older form of worship to God, burn offerings, all those things you read in the Old Testament. The Romans did not want Jesus. They wanted them to worship the old way. They didn't want Jesus. No part of, they didn't wanted no part of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about the hall of faith. You guys ever heard of the hall of faith? It's the Old Testament patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph. All the Old Testament characters that show great faith and and gave us great examples of faith. Well, chapter 11 speaks to this. Chapter 11 speaks to how there's a whole grandstand of all those Old Testament leaders that are cheering us on in our run, that are cheering these Hebrews on, saying, hey, you guys can do this, hang in there, because they were promised salvation. They were promised the Messiah. Of course, they never got to see it. So now they are cheering these people on, saying, hang in there. There's something greater, and it's Jesus. That's the theme of this book. Jesus is greater. It's encouraging. He's trying to encourage these readers. Hey, hang in there. Jesus is greater than what you're facing. So that's what we're reading about this morning. Uh, We're starting in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are sounded... um, Uh, Excuse me, chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So the first thing he addresses to these Jewish people, he says that sin so easily entangles. He's talking about the sin that so easily entangles. Well, why is sin so easily entangling? Well, because it's available, right? It's surrounded. The world just has sin. And so these Jews were having to deal with that. It was right there. It was available for them to do. They were easily, it's a lot easier to fall into sin than to follow Christ. So he's speaking to say that this can easily entangle you. Stay away from it. And it distracts them from their growth. Listen, think about the persecution they were facing. Death, prison, all these things. If they're not even defeating sin, how are they going to defeat the pressures that come after them. So what the writer says, he gives them uh, motivation to do this. But here's the thing about sin, okay? Sin causes separation. Separation from God causes death, spiritual death. Sin separates us. Separation causes spiritual death. I want you to think of this as like a, a nice plant, ficus, a fern, whatever you please. Nice branches coming off, but the stem is God. We are the branches. If we cut that branch or leaf or flower and we pull it away, over time, what's going to happen? It's going to wilt. It's going to wilt. It's going to wilt. When sin entered the world, we were separated. When sin enters the heart, we're separated. Sin causes separation. And separation causes death. Students, you can separate yourself 
with peer pressure, giving in to peer pressure. That's a real thing that can separate us from God. I've lived it. I know it. It can happen. Coping with stress negatively, trying to carry all that weight on your own, it can separate you from the love of God. Lust. Lust is a very, very dangerous sin to fall into. It can wreck a marriage, and it also can bring baggage into a newly one. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, the ultimate joy is Christ reconnected us with God. But how, how can we reconnect ourselves now? Well, he answers that in verse 2 and 3. Marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, scorning his shame as he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So, what the, what the writer's saying here to the, uh, to the Jews, Jesus set a mark out a long time ago. He knew, he knew that mankind was going to fall. He knew that we were going to struggle and that these people were going to face persecution. So, he set a mark out for them to fix their eyes on. He tells them, fix their eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus because you can take joy in your run. You can take joy in your run because Jesus paid the debt that man could not pay. He's telling them, fix your eyes on the fact that he paid the debt that you could not pay. When sin entered the world, way back in Genesis, when Eve was deceived by the serpent, and sin entered the world, okay? There was a moral debt placed on mankind. At this point, separation. Moral debt placed on mankind. And that debt could not be paid by, by you or I. In fact, Romans uh, chapter 6, verse 27, um, paraphrasing says that um, the wages of sin are to be paid for by death. They were to be paid for by the blood of a man. Man allowed sin in the world. Now man has to pay for that sin. But the problem is... Could I pay for that sin? No. Could these people pay for that sin? No. If I had to try and sacrifice myself to save you, I'm sorry, you'd be in trouble. And you know what? That's the same for everyone because we're broken. When sin entered the world, we became broken. It took a perfect, sinless man of God to pay the sin for mankind and wipe away the debt, and that is Jesus Jesus was perfect, he was sinless, he came down in the form of man, and he opened the door of, of salvation and freedom for all of us by paying that debt. So the author calls for us to fix our eyes on that. Fix your eyes on the fact that Jesus has already wiped away the persecution you're facing. He's wiped away the debt. Now you have a mark to run to. Now, and that mark is the cross. We have a mark to run to. These Jewish people had a mark to run to. The problem is, if you don't have a mark, what happens? You get lost. You wander. A sheep that doesn't have a shepherd, what happens? It's all over the place, right? Jesus was the mark for these Jewish people to run to. He's our mark to run to. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 through 9 says this. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood, but have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone and accepts his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children, for his children are not disciplined by their father. If you are not disciplined, everyone does not undergo discipline. You are not legitimate, true sons and daughters. Moreover, if we have all had human fathers, if we all have human fathers who disciplined us, we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? So just remember the context now. Remember the persecution that was going on here. This persecution that these newly converted Jews were facing. So um, they were facing serious persecution to move away from Christ. So what encouragement does the author provide? He advises, he advises to endure hardship as discipline. And we're not talking about the discipline of being grounded or, you know, getting in trouble from your father. No, he's talking about spiritual maturity growing in you through your hardship. 
father disciplines the one he loves. So he uses this dynamic of God being our good father who knows what's best for us, who best for us, who disciplines through his heart, who, his, the hardship. When you endure hardship and you run to God, instead of carrying that weight of hardship, whatever it may be, whatever bad things are going on, when you run to God, it creates spiritual maturity for you to withstand for you to withstand all the things that come into this life. So you may be asking yourself, well, I don't know about that. I mean, listen, he's God, right? He could just wipe it all away. I mean, why would he make us go through this? Why, why would he do this? He could just wipe it all away. In verse 11, it says this, no discipline, no discipline seems pleasant at first, at the time, but painful later on. However, it produces a harvest righteousness and peace and joy for those who are trained by it. Listen, we need to understand something, okay? This world that we live in is broken. It's been broken for a very, very, very long time. Back in Genesis, what we just talked about, when sin entered the world, the world became broken. So all the bad things that happen, all the stress, the depression, unemployment, the cancer, all the things that we have to live with and endure, it's a result of this world. It's not a result of God bringing things down. God doesn't bring these things down on you, but what happens is he allows it to happen because of this broken world. He allows things to happen. He allows us to run through these sufferings. He allows us to run. Yes, God does heal. God does do miracles. But some things he allows to happen, not to punish you, but to show you that you need him and that you need to confide in him in our struggles. My wife, we were, we were driving home yesterday, and we were kind of talking about this subject of enduring hardship and creating that spiritual discipline and how God will supply your needs. And we were just talking about it, and she reminded me of something that happened to us um, um, a couple years ago. And I actually didn't even, I mean, I knew about the situation, but I didn't quite understand this. So paraphrasing and just, you know, leaving out some details, we were expecting some finances to come in, right? And it did not happen. Okay, for technicalities and what, what have you, something we were kind of relying on, okay? So you can imagine kind of the, oh, oh no, what's going to happen here? We were pretty stressed out, okay? She told me this, and I had no idea, which, by the way, fellas, bring your spiritual life in with your wife. Bring your wife in on your spiritual life. Good things happen when you do that. Growth happens when you do that. She told me that, yeah, she said, I remember when that happened, and I remember the next day just thinking, you know what? She just prayed. She said, God, you know what? Your son's on the throne. This is rough, but we're going to lean on you to get through it. And she told me ever since then, ever since then, things just haven't been quite as bad when, when bad things happen. We've just kind of leaned on God. I was blown away. She never told me that. I never knew that. And it, it's such a good concept. I am not didn't tell you that just to brag on my wife. I told you that because it's truth. When bad things happen, when we go through suffering, whatever it may be, in-home disputes, family problems, finances, debt, depression, God is there to pick you up. And when you put your faith in him to get through that, instead of turning to the world, turning for instant, instant relief through sin, God will carry you through that. And what that does is that builds spiritual maturity. So every time it happens again, you're a little stronger. You're a little stronger. You're a little stronger. That's the harvest he talks about in, in verse 11. Building spiritual maturity so that when bad things come, we are able to withstand them because we've seen what God can do. We've seen how he can move. When, they, when we don't do that, we get spiritually drained. How do we, how do we refresh ourselves? We refresh ourselves by worshiping Christ. We turn to Christ when we become spiritually drained. And how do we do that? We worship him through prayer. Build that relationship. Build that prayer life with God and give him these struggles. Present them to him so he can be the one that carries them and not you. Of course, you've got to deal with them, but he's going to carry them. We had a speaker here. I can't remember when it was, but he talked about how when you pray to Jesus, pray to him like he's right there in front of you. That's a great way to pray. It really connects you with the Father. We worship him through community. What you're doing right now, 
okay? Being here, being here among believers, singing worship songs together, shaking hands, bringing people into your struggles, letting them pray for you, that is power. There's power in that. When we do that, when we bring other people in community like God calls us to, it really helps us carry that weight. It helps us run our, our race well. And then we search him through the scriptures. God's word is always a prayer. There's so much power in this book. This book was written and inspired by God. Written by people that were inspired through God. It survived, it survived many, many years of translations. All translated from the original. This book has power. We're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. We can trust God through Jesus through our difficult times. I'm telling you, just like we talked about earlier, build those fences now. When bad things come, build those fences by confiding in our God. When bad things come, run to Christ. Set your mark for Christ and run to him. Students, let me tell you something. What you're doing right now, being here, being in church on Wednesdays, small groups, whatever it is, let me tell you something. That is an amazing thing that you're doing right now. You are laying a foundation for your life that's going to pay dividends on your marathon run. Doing that now is so, so important. You have to continue to build that because your relationship, when you, when you get out of school or when you get into the world, you're going you're gonna to see that, hey, this world life is great, but there's also things that will attack you. But you know what? If you've been building that faith, building that foundation like you're doing now, you are going to have a strong foundation when you get out. I wish that I could, be that, could have done that. I wish I could have spent my years in high school, middle school, whatever, running to God, worshiping God, but instead I didn't. And so what happened was when I got out, I, I had no fences built. So the world just impacted my heart. Students, keep up the good work. Stay in what you're doing. In Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 7, it's an awesome story. Um, one of my friends called me about this story as I was preparing this, and uh, he, he had a church service. He listened to this story, and quite frankly, I, I'd never really heard that story. I guess I read over it. Um, some of you are probably like, Joe, come on, man. That, that, that's easy stuff. Come on. That, that's rookie league, but hey, you know, I missed it. Um, Acts chapter 12, verses 6 through 7. So Peter, the apostle Peter, was... Um, he and the other apostles at the time, King Herod, uh, the king of Rome, was, was persecuting Christians. At Denver. They did not want Christianity to get out. They did not want the word to spread. So King Herod was taking the apostles and imprisoning them. And in, in, in uh, verse 6, he got to Peter. But look how Peter handled this. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and Serenity's good, uh, soldiers stood bound with two chains and stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in his cell. He struck Peter on one side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. So what's that story about? Yeah, it's about how great, good, uh, how great God is and how he delivers us through things. But what's amazing about that story is Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, while in prison, while possibly facing death, he was asleep because he knew. He knew that Christ was greater. He knew that what he was doing was for a cause that was greater than anything, that was greater than this world, that was greater than the bondage that he was in. So there were one or two things were going to happen. God was going to deliver him, was going to free him, or two, he was going to have his life taken, but he was going to be with his father because he believed that Christ paid the debt through, through salvation. Man, we can take a lot from that. We can take a lot from that. When we turn to Christ, the things of this world, when you build that relationship with Christ, the things of this world, they don't seem quite as heavy. When Christ is carrying that load with you, Things are not quite as heavy. And I know this might be hard. Listen, I understand that there are many of you in here today who probably are carrying something pretty heavy. There's probably, um, probably some heartbreak, 
probably things going on in your life that, you know, you're, you're just, you're really struggling on your run right now. And I understand that that's a real thing. And maybe it's sin. Maybe it's sin that's knocked you off the path and that's gotten you off your run. Whatever that may be, anger. Anger's one I've dealt with a lot, okay? I've dealt with anger. It really held me back on my run. Whatever it may be, sin can entangle our run. Or maybe you're just facing bad luck or you're facing bumps in the road or there's things in your life on your run that's knocking you off course. Maybe you've applied for that program or you're trying to get into that school or you're trying to do whatever the requirements you need and it's just not clicking for you right now and you see denial. Maybe that's knocking you off your run and it's got you exhausted. Maybe you don't feel like you're living up to where you should be in your own eyes and the world's eyes. Maybe you are feeling like you are just not living up, and so depression is setting in, and so anxiety is taking over. These are real things that can affect your run. They're very real things. But I'm going to tell you something that will carry you through. Just to go back to my testimony real quick. While during this time of being spiritually flat, while I was working, um, at a gym in Ackworth, uh, our Parks and Rec gym, I met Frank Bennett and I met Jackson Grant, okay? They invited me and my wife to Lake Point Church, and by the glory of God, we got plugged back into our faith. We got back into our faith, and I'm telling you, the, the difference of life, unbelievable. It was amazing to get back into the Word and to, to get back in back in my faith. Because let me tell you something, when you're spiritually flat, when you are spiritually flat, things get heavy. And sometimes, and I've heard people tell me this, and I completely understand, when we become spiritually flat, we start to read this book as if it's just another book. But through the scriptures, we find how great Christ is. Through the words on this page, we become one with Christ, and we see how great he is and how he carries us through our run. I've heard people tell me that, you know what, when I read this book, it just doesn't, it doesn't connect. It just feels like another book. I've heard that, and you know what? I kind of felt that at some point because when I look, used to look at the Bible, I used to think of it like this, and by, I just think we're reading this book wrong sometimes. I looked at the Bible as a linear story. Right? We started with Genesis. We went to Moses. He went through the wilderness. We got to Joshua. He circled a city three times. God is great. Then we go on and on. Then we get Jesus, and it's just a linear story. That's not how the Bible is. Think of the patterns. Man falls. God raises up. Man falls. God raises up and ultimately raises up through salvation through the blood of Christ. I'm here to tell you guys, listen to me. In verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 39, you study the scriptures, this is Jesus talking to Pharisees, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that you have them, think that you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And what's amazing about that is, what is Jesus telling us? He's telling us that the scriptures are all about me. The Bible is all about Jesus. It does not matter what you're reading, Old Testament, New Testament. Jesus is so great and he's so perfect that the Bible is all about him. Take some of these Old Testament stories. Uh, cha in Daniel chapter 3, we looked at, we, we've looked at this before. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, three men who were persecuted for not worshiping false gods, not worshiping false idols. So what they did is they uh, were cast into persecution. They were sent to be thrown in a blazing furnace. Think about that. Man fails, is sent for doom in a furnace. In verse 24, King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly your majesty. He said, look, I see four men rock walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. The spirit of Jesus was there to pull these men out of the fire. God was showing 
through that story that Jesus will pull man out of the fire. Take Jonah, chapter 2, verse chapter 2, right? We've read that story multiple times. Jonah swallowed by a fish. What happened in that story? Jonah disobeyed God. He told Jonah, Jonah was a prophet, I need you to go speak to these people. Jonah ran away from that. He got on a ship, he got on a ship, um, went on the ocean, okay? What happened? Storm came, knocked him off. What happened then? Swallowed by a fish, okay? Three days, Jonah spent in the belly of the fish. So man falls, he's in the pit, and the third day, what happened? Jonah was resurrected from the fish. The third day that Christ died, bled for our sins, he was resurrected and all of mankind was saved. And in verse 9, Jonah says this, But I will shout with grateful praise and will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. I say salvation comes from the Lord. God used Jonah to show you and I and all these Jewish people that were facing persecution, hey, there will be a rise of man. At that time, they didn't know who that was, but we know what that points to. We know that that points to Christ, the ultimate redeemer. Take David and Goliath. What is the theme we talk about when we read David and Goliath, right? It's usually something like this. Face your giants. Throw your rock of faith and take down those giants. And listen, if you've drawn inspiration from that, there's nothing wrong with that. But I'm going to challenge you to look at David and Goliath just a little bit differently. That is a story of redemption. That is a story that points to Christ. How we've looked at it in the past, David is my debt. David, or excuse me, Goliath is my debt. Goliath is my depression, and we are David. No, no. David is the debt. David is the, David is the world, but Christ, or excuse me, Goliath is the world. Christ, or David is Christ. I want you to think about something. How did David defeat Goliath? He picked up five stones. Picked up five stones. It took one to take down Goliath. The five stones, they represent the five wounds that that saved you and I from eternity, from eternal fire. Five wounds that saved us. Five wounds that bled from Jesus, that lifted us, took us away from separation from the Father. The five wounds, or hand, hand, foot, foot, and rib. And that blood that bled, it saved you and I. David and Goliath is a story about redeeming man. Redeeming man through faith. Faith in Jesus. David and Goliath points to Jesus. If you want to insert yourself in the story, that's fine. Insert yourself in the armies that were around that great battle. And we, that's us, we are cheering on Jesus. We are cheering on him for defeating death, defeating sin, defeating it, crushing its head by the power of his salvation because he is God that lifted us and saved us. Insert your story there, cheering on Jesus and letting Jesus defeat those battles. And then, of course, probably my favorite and the most subtle in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Very subtly, when the serpent deceived Eve, And God found out. He said to the serpent, and I will put enmity between you and woman, meaning rivalry, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. You will strike his heel, meaning man at the hands of man kills Jesus, puts him on the cross, sacrifices him. Man kills him. The serpent has his head crushed. Think about it. Jesus has lifted us. He will crush your the serpent's head. He crushes the serpent's head by defeating death on the cross, by lifting us in salvation, and one day he will ultimately crush it once and for all. The Bible is all about Jesus. When you need inspiration, don't just read this Bible for what the stories that you see. The Bible is all about Christ because he is greater. Because he is greater than the, this life, he's greater than the sin, he's greater than the depression, he's greater than the things you may be facing. He was greater than what these Jews were facing. That's why this letter was written, because Christ is our Savior and he is greater. 
when you read this book, don't look at the stories themselves. Look at the overshadow of Jesus who has lifted us. So we're going to close today with one final worship song. And before we, before we get into that, I just want you to know, Jesus is greater than the struggles. We are on a race and a marathon that's full of twists and turns, that's full of, uh, of ruts, and we're going to fall. We're going to roll our ankle. We're going to stumble. We're going to make mistakes because we're broken. But God has laid a mark out for us in Jesus that we can follow, that we can take all of our guilt, all of our shame, all of our sin, and we can throw it to him, and we can put our faith and trust in him. When the hardships come and the bad things come in life, rest easy in Jesus because he defeated death. He defeated death on the cross, and he has unlocked the door of eternity with God. He's unlocked that for us. So we can rest easy in our struggles that Jesus is greater than what we may face. And I'm telling you, one day he will return and he will restore heaven on earth and he will ultimately defeat Satan and defeat sin once and for all. We can take joy in that. We can look past our struggles and take joy in that. Hey, if you have not, if you have not placed your heart in Jesus on your walk. If you have not yet accepted him as your Lord and Savior, if you have not accepted him in your heart that he died for your sins and that he paid the debt that you could not pay, don't leave here today without doing that. Because I'm telling you, if you put your if you cast your burdens on Jesus, he will carry you through. And he will unlock the door of eternity with the Father through you and you can walk toward the Father when you put your faith in Jesus. If you haven't done that, come see us. There's, I'm here. I'll be more than happy to walk you through that. If there's, there's other leaders here, you can go see them. They can walk you through that. Don't leave here today if you have not put your faith and trust in Christ and you have not received salvation because we're all on our run. We're all on our marathon run. And whether you've accepted him or not, Jesus is right there with you. He's got his hand out. All you've got to do is grab it. And we do that through prayer and acceptance in him. If you have accepted Christ and you are on your run, don't forget. Rest easy in your struggles because Christ has defeated them. Christ has defeated your struggles and he's defeated it and unlocked a door of eternity for you. So take your rest in him. Take rest in God the Father.